Hi folks, Matt Easton here. So we are finally getting around to talking about the 1908 Patton Sword, that is the British 1908 Patton Troopers Cavalry Sword. This um, officially, on paper at least, became the standard British Cavalry Sword for all branches of um, cavalry from 1908. However, it's worth mentioning that it wasn't rolled out across all regiments um, for a few years after that. In actual fact there are um, certainly photographs from the early um, stages of the First World War where yeomanry cavalry regiments still have the old 1890 pattern. So uh, to outline basically what it is, it is a completely thrust centric model of sword. It, uh, it was one of the swords that inspired the um, American so-called pattern saber, that's actually a sword as I've talked about in previous videos. Um, it's completely straight. It, does it have any cutting capacity? Well, it it does have the edge sharp, and this is a First World War example um, that was um, made in 1915, and it was actually sharpened for, for service. It does have an edge on it, but you're not going to be able to really chop with it. You could hit someone with it, and it would be hitting like hitting them with a with an iron bar with a with an angled edge on it. But it's not really going to cut in the typical sabre sense of the word. It is a dedicated thrusting sword. Now, um, one of the things that people often assume when they uh, look at a, a sword that is narrow and pointy like this is that it is light. As I've mentioned in my videos about rapiers, um, rapiers aren't light. Rapiers are very often heavier than broadswords and backswords. And this is no different. Because this is a dedicated thrusting sword, what they've done is they've made the blade, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but they've made the blade very thick. It is really a rigid, really, 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 I can flex it, but that's about as much as I can flex it. It's a really, really rigid bar. And of course, what that means is when you um, apply a point on horseback, all of that force goes into the target instead of flexing the blade. As soon as, you, as soon as the blade flexes upon impact, of course you're losing energy that could be transferred into the target. Um, so being a very thick bar, essentially, um, it is actually quite a heavy sword. I've weighed this. This, this example, um, you'll notice in books they often give fixed weights for certain military patterns of sword. And in actual fact, between makers and even between individual examples from a given maker, there is some variation always. Um, this example weighs about um, just over three pounds, about three and um, just under three and a quarter pounds. Now that, for a, for a one-handed sword uh, with a 35 inch blade as this has, that's actually pretty heavy. That's about as heavy as medieval arming swords get. Okay, the, pretty much the heaviest medieval arming swords that I'm aware of don't weigh more than this. Okay, so people think about the 1908, uh, you know, as a thrusting sword and as a light and nimble thing. It is not. It is a heavy pointed bar. Okay, um, so when I when I refer to this as a, a short lance, it is really it is really a pointed bar for applying point uh, from horseback using the power of the horse, the power and speed of the horse. It is not a light and nimble fencing sword by any stretch of the imagination. The point of balance is quite close to the hand. You'll see it's about two inches from the bowl of the guard. But where does the weight come from? Well, as I've mentioned, it's a very thick um, bar, essentially, pointed bar of a, of a blade. But you'll also notice there's a lot of weight in the hilt on this, and that's why the point of balance is far back. It has a very big bowl guard, and part of the reason for that is because this is a very offensive sword. It's, it's designed to give point whilst hiding the sword arm and the head behind that bowl guard. This is like having a buckler stuck on the back end of a pointed bar. So this has a lot of weight to it. It's a very big, thick, solid guard. Very, very big. And it's got also a large pommel at the back. I'll just bring that up there. Um, and it's just, just generally quite a... Um, robust construction for a sword. It's, it's really quite chunky. Okay, so think of it as a big chunky bar that you get into position, get your horse moving fast, and you basically stay there and move the point to where it needs to go. And as I've shown in a previous video, once the point goes into the target, as you go zooming past it, 
you, you extract the point out and then bring the point back online again. It is not a fencing sword. Would I want to use this for fighting on foot? Hell no, okay? It is not at all nimble. It's quite, actually, quite cumbersome. Yes, I could just about get away with it, and I could probably use it like a rapier, okay? Um, by keeping the point online, or trying as much as possible to keep up the point online, I could possibly use it on foot, but it is not set up to be used like that. And people often compare this sword with the infantry officer's sword, the 1897 pattern, which also has a dedicated thrusting blade, but they are utterly different. Uh, that is a relatively nimble sword. It's not as nimble as some people think it might be. It's not like a small sword. Um, it is a fairly robust blade still on it, um, but it is much more nimble than this big cavalry version. Now, if we just look what led up, led up to this sword, um, <coughs> I will just put that down. What we have here is the 1864 pattern. This is actually a relatively difficult sword to get hold of these days. Um, partly because a lot of these were modified in later um, versions of the cavalry sword. So the 1864, what really identified this was the introduction of this bowl guard uh, with the Maltese cross, as you can see there. Um, and this general form of guard, or what, there's actually changes, but what uh, this kind of general look of guard, um, with married with this type of cut and thrust blade, persisted right the way through to um, 1899, when it was replaced by the 1899 pattern, which I've shown in a previous video. But in actual fact, the 1899 pattern wasn't produced in huge numbers and wasn't rolled out to all cavalry uh, regiments. So the, the final sort of version of this was the 1890 pattern. And the 1890 pattern is the pattern that was still shown being carried by some yeomanry cavalry regiments in World War I and was then replaced by the 1908 thrusting sword. So what really defines this sword is that it has a cut and thrust blade, okay? What actually came before this was the 1853. The 1853 differs only from the 1864, really, in having a three bar hilt instead of a dish hilt. And of course, the dish hilt offers more protection to the hand than the three bar guard. However, the three bar guard was produced in very large numbers and did persist in service. It's mentioned by Alfred Hutton in 1867 as if it's still the regulation cavalry sword, even though this was patented in 1864. So it's very clear that, and he was in quite, um, uh, he was in quite uh, well, you know, mainstream, uh, well-respected cavalry regiments. So it's quite clear that even at that point, mainstream cavalry regiments hadn't yet really received the 1864 pattern, and this probably wasn't made in very large numbers for quite a few years. Um, <clears throat> so, but what really defines this is the cut and thrust blade. So this has the same length blade as the 1908, okay? But, as you can clearly see, the blade at the bottom here is broader. But what may surprise you is it's not heavier, okay? Um, the, or at least the whole sword is not heavier. In actual fact, the 1864 that I'm holding below here, I've just weighed it, and this weighs two and a half pounds. Okay, this weighs three and a quarter pounds. So what looks like to some people, an, a, a, you know, a more nimble and lighter sword, is not. The 1908 is actually a heavier sword. Um, <clears throat> and most of that weight, I have to say, is in the hilt. So if you just took the blades without the hilts themselves, the blade of the 1908 is probably slightly lighter than the um, 1864 blade, the cut and thrust blade below. Um, but the hilt of the 1908 is probably quite a bit heavier, it's got more meat in it. So really, the, um, as many of my viewers will now know, the debate that went throughout the 19th century was this, this question of cut versus thrust, and whether British cavalry, and the, they had the same debate in other countries, in France and Germany, and even in um, South American countries like Brazil, um, the, the debate over whether it was better to have a sword that was better at cutting or better at thrusting. Um, and as I've mentioned in previous videos, often when you add something to a weapon, you have to subtract from it somewhere else. It's very difficult to take, if you take a blade that's 
a general cut and thrust blade, like a backsword blade, if you want to make that better at cutting, for example making it broader, that generally speaking makes it worse at thrusting. If you want to make it curved to make it better at cutting, that makes it generally worse at thrusting. So it's wherever you add something you have to subtract from somewhere else and what this is is this this blade came in in 1821 and it it changed a bit over the years they they sometimes they lightened it sometimes they shortened it they did various things to this basic blade but this basic british um essentially what was known as the regulation uh, cavalry blade cut and thrust blade persisted from 1821 until 1908 until the 1908 replaced it so it's actually in use across the british empire across the world in numerous wars in India, China, Afghanistan, uh, South Africa, all over the place, um, and you know, used very effectively. It was used for an incredibly long period of time, nearly a hundred years, um, and you know, through many, many wars, through some of the bloodiest period of, of um, colonial history, and it it was a fairly effective blade. It's I've got many of this type of blade, and they are quite good at cutting, in fact they're very good at cutting, they're as good as a back sword and they're as good as most arming swords. Um, so they cut very well. They thrust okay and this is where the issue came in. The top brass of the military always had a perception that the thrust was something that should be promoted in the British cavalry and you got the same thing in, in France and in, in French cavalry. Famous quote from Napoleon telling his cavalrymen to um, not sabre, in other words not cut, but to give point, um, because of course the thrust is generally speaking more fatal. However there are other issues, there are other problems with the thrust. The very first fundamental one is even if you teach people to thrust, under stress, under pressure, they still tend to cut anyway. So if you give them a dedicated thrusting sword and you teach them to thrust, when they panic in action, they may end up hitting with it anyway, and if they have a dedicated thrusting sword, they're not going to do any damage with the cutting. So that's one issue. Another issue is the question of thrust. When you thrust someone, it exposes you in a sense, because even if you run them through, they're not usually, or at least 50% of the time, shall we say, they're not going to instantly drop dead. And there are many cases from the Indian Mutiny and the Sikh Wars, for example, and the same in Afghanistan, where an opponent was run through, and then in return, cut the person giving the thrust through the head or through the sword arm or whatever. And this happened against bayonets as well. So that's the other problem, is that in giving thrust, whilst your sword is in the person's body, you're kind of vulnerable and they are kind of free to hit you back. The other problem is one of extraction, and that is, as I've shown with the 1908, they went to great lengths to train the troopers to give point and then immediately extract. There was a very specific technique for doing it. And uh, John Jacob and, and various other writers in the 19th century point out that they had either seen, or in the case of John Jacob, personally done himself, um, given point during combat, and had the opponent's body run all the way up to the hilt, and then been disarmed because of the speed of the horse. And this is a problem, of course, of, of giving a thrust on horseback, is you have to know how, how to extract the point, and you have to train how to extract the point, which is why if you look at modern skillet arms, where they um, run the sword point through a hoop, um, much like they did with um, training in the medieval period, um, with quintain and such like, but also running it through a sandbag, for example. Um, sometimes they let go of the sabre and leave it sticking in it, but um, what you're supposed to do, of course, most of the time, is you run the sandbag through, and as the horse goes past, you extract the sword, you let the sword extract out, like shown in the um, pathé videos that I posted in my previous video. So you have to train yourself not only to give point, but also to extract the point. This is not an issue with the cut, of course, where you have a cutting sword and you're on horseback. Anybody without, you know, with very minimal training, even if you're just treating the sword like a stick pretty much, can lay the sword across the target, hit it, and it will naturally slice and slide off or through the target. You don't have to extract a cut. A cut naturally extracts itself. A thrust does not naturally extract itself. Anyway. By the end of the 19th century, many governments had come to the conclusion that what 
their cavalry is needed was a thrusting sword. And this is partly due to the nature of how warfare had changed over, over the 19th century. Obviously, um, breech loading, magazine fed rifles had come in, machine guns were starting to, um, by 1900, become a little bit more common. Marksmanship had become, you know, accuracy with, with rifles had become outstanding. So essentially firearms had, had meant that uh, cavalry did not fulfill the, exactly the same role as they used to. They still fulfilled the same role, but maybe not to the same magnitudes in the same areas as they used to. Cavalry had become more important perhaps for scouting, but also for dismounting and using as mounted infantry. That is, they could manoeuvre quickly around an area, dismount, fire their rifles as, as, or carbines as infantry, mount up and then move somewhere else. Which, incidentally, is how English archers functioned during the Hundred Years' War. Um, So-called mounted archers in the English army in the 15th century did the same thing. They rode to a place, dismounted, shot off a load of arrows, mounted up, and then moved somewhere else. Um, and in the context of World War I, this sword makes sense. Um, <clears throat> what you really lose with this sword, that you, that you have with this sword, is the ability to melee. And this is, this is my argument, this is not necessarily fact. Because you have to remember that in World War I, there were successful cavalry actions. However, the vast majority of them took the, the, um, the kind of framework of attacking infantry, retreating, attacking uh, artillery positions, um, and these kind of attacking baggage trains, these kind of opportunistic sending the cavalry in where they could do a job better than anyone else. And in actual fact there were, uh, contrary to what most people expect or, or what they think they know about World War I, Cavalry did play quite an important role in certain parts of World War I, particularly at the beginning and end of the war in Europe. But of course, don't forget the war was also in the Middle East and North Africa, um, where Arab cavalry played a very an important role against the Turks. Um, but um, even in Europe, both German, um, but German, Belgian, French and British cavalry all played important parts at various, at various points. <coughs> but where this sword really stands up, the cut and thrust sword, is you can both charge in giving point or you can get into a melee where cavalry comes against cavalry and you can use the sword defensively, offensively, attacking and uh, defending yourself all around, both cutting and thrusting with this type of sabre, which makes sense in a 19th century context, like in the Crimean War or the Indian Mutiny or Afghanistan. This type of sword makes more sense in an early 20th century World War I type scenario. Um, so, <clears throat> to conclude, a lot of people have said that the 1908 pattern is like the ultimate, um, the ultimate cavalry sword. And some writers have, I think stupidly and uh, <laughs> with completely uninformed way, said that this was the end of an evolutionary point in cavalry sword design. I call bullshit on that, okay? The fact is that weapons are only relevant to their context. There's my favourite word, okay? Weapons are designed to fit into a specific environment and that is where they function best. If you take a Renaissance rapier and, and put it into the Dark Ages, it ceases to work properly anymore. There's not much use for a rapier in a Viking shield wall, okay? Similarly, I would argue that the 1908 pattern thrusting sword is not well suited to most 19th century cavalry applications. It would not function very well in the charge of the light brigade, which concluded in a melee at the guns. I, I do not believe it would work very well in India or China or Afghanistan, um, uh, particularly in India, where, melee, where cavalry melees mixed pell-mell affairs against tool wires and shields were, were the order of the day. I do not believe it would work well in that environment. It is a heavy thrusting bar. It is relatively immobile. It is very good for giving point. It is very good if you're treating your cavalry like a missile. You're sending them, you see an open point, you're sending them in at the charge to give point and then they get out again. 
that makes sense. If you're going to fight in a more conventional 19th century cavalry sense, what you want is a cut and thrust sword. Okay, so there we go guys, some food for thought. Cheers. <laughs>